Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Friday, February 24th, 2023. It's my great pleasure to be here with Professor George M. Whitesides. George, it is great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. George, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? I'm a professor of chemistry at Harvard University. Strictly speaking, I was until recently a university professor, but I gave back the university professorship. Now, is it the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, or that's a previous It's department? Chemistry and Chemical Biology, that's correct. When, when did those departments merge, or when was the creation of that as a single department? How did that happen? I don't know how it happened. It, it was the addition of the name of Chemical Biology to the Chemistry Department, and I think it occurred simply because biology has become an important part of chemistry. And when exactly it occurred, I don't know, but it was sometime after I joined Harvard, which met in 1984. Now, when you were university professor, that was the named chair was Woodford L. and Ann A. Flowers, university research professor? That sounds roughly right. Woodward, Woodford L. and Ann A. Flowers, yes. Do you know who they are or were? Did you have a chance to interact with them? Not with them, but with their son. George, what, what does it mean to be a university professor at Harvard? I know it's a very rare honor. Is it, is it simply an honorific, or are there specific responsibilities or roles that go along with that? It seems to me that nothing, nothing changes. So I would say it is primarily a honorific title. I mean, there was what the dean, the then dean, told me was that you can teach a course on anything you want, whether you're in, whether you know anything about it or not. And I have plenty to do with my life, so making up new courses uh, with no background is not the thing that I do for a spare my spare time. Now, you gave up the university professor honorific, but you're not emeritus. You're still active. I'm still active, yes. I still have a research group. I still do research. Just as a snapshot in time, what are some of the things you're currently working on? Origin of life, um, self-assembled monolayers. Um, we do a fair amount of work on magnetism in various forms, uh, magnetic levitation and origins and finding new ways of using it. Um, some work in chemical biology, finding things out about how to inhibit virology and related subjects. So we work on what I tell the group is we, if somebody else is doing it, we don't do it. So what we try to do is to do things that are different than what most chemists do. George, some overall questions about the research that you've conducted in your career. In reviewing your publication list, it's difficult to see what areas of chemistry you haven't taken on. Are there any that jump out in your memory that you simply haven't been involved in? Well, we haven't done very much total synthesis, which is what chemistry has been deeply involved in for a while. And we haven't been involved in Sort of conventional chemical biology, finding out enzymatic mechanisms and doing things of that sort. We probably could do that if we wanted to, but it just isn't something that the students have wanted to do. What explains that? What are some of the trends that, that guide student interest? You know, those are really good question. Uh, one thing is where they think they can find a job, um, a perfectly sensible approach. Another thing is what's new and New can be new because it's new, or new can be new because it's fashionable and it's come to people's attention. Um, it's, the, you know, one of the things I've learned over the course of running a research group for years is that the group runs best if it is for the benefit of the students rather than for the benefit of me. And so from that point of view, I would say it depends upon the student and what the student wants to do in my cleverness, my ability to figure out what those things are. George, what aspects of your research have been purely fundamental basic science research and where have you been motivated by applications for societal benefit? We do both and we try to meld them so that the general structure of a good research project is one that starts from curiosity and then builds a science base and based on that science, we find applications. And based on the applications, 
we go on in some way to try to commercialize what's going on. But my view is that if my neighbors pay for my research, they do so on the general grounds that A, they don't know what's going on, but B, they hope that it leads to a better world. And so I should do something to show that what we're doing actually benefits them or their children in some way. So that's the underlying sort of circular theme in this. George, what have been some of the happiest surprises where you took on a research project simply out of curiosity and you realized that this was something that really could be translated into things that help people? And a recent example is soft robotics, where we were interested in uh, the modes of action and the mechanisms of movement of things that are alive but are not us. So how do those things work and can you replicate them? Because there must be a reason why snakes do what snakes do and insects do what insects do. And so that has turned out to be a actually very productive area. There are a lot of people working in soft robotics now. And part of the applications in a practical sense for what you do is in food handling. Now, we don't handle food. That's not our business. But there's a company and the company handles food and everybody's very happy with it. And it does something that can't be done with conventional robotics. What have been some of the technological advances for which nanotechnology became an area of interest for you? Well, nanotechnology was an area which existed long before we had anything to do with it. So as a somebody who's familiar with Caltech's background, you know the importance of nanoelectronics. And that's really the core of this subject as far as nano goes. How do you make things smaller, make them more connected, and do so in such a way that the pieces don't interfere with one another? Also, the chips um, program that you see now coming out of Washington is an appreciation of how important it is in both civilian and military life. In thinking about application translating the research, when have you been inspired to create a company yourself, not to just share this idea with others? Um, well, I think a fair answer to that is that it's very difficult to create a company yourself in a university environment because it takes, I mean, my rule of thumb is it takes about 10 years, 10 to 15 years and about $100 million to create a real company from nothing. So we don't have that kind of resource basis. And so we have to work with others. And the thing that I've learned over the course of time, another thing I've learned over the course of time is that good engineers, good experienced engineers can do things we can't do. So the job of a company is to hire good experienced engineers. And our job is to do things that make the science base for something interesting. And a way of doing that is to start from curiosity. And I'm a great believer in curiosity as motivating force in science. On that basis, I wonder if you can reflect on the idea that you have used chemistry as a springboard to focus on questions that are of relevance to all of science, not simply chemistry. Well, matter is matter and matter is made of atoms and the job of chemistry, a job of chemistry, is to manipulate atoms in new forms of matter for new purposes. So that ranges all the way from antivirals to new rubbers to, you know, take your choice. But every field needs new ideas. And every once in a while, one hopes if you have new ideas that one of them catches hold and becomes something interesting and important. George, you have a career span that, that goes before computation was terribly important in the field. And today it's it's central. What has that meant for you in your research, the rise of computational power? Well, the rise of computational power means that we can now use canned programs to calculate magnetic fields and electric fields and whatever we want to. It's very good for that kind of thing. Heat capacities, tensile strengths, you know, all the, the properties of material science, because we're as much material science as scientists as we are chemists. But over and above that, I would say that it causes one to think about what you know and what you don't know in interesting and unusual ways. 
So we have finally, in the last couple of years, started programs that have the characteristic that they are um, applications of chemistry to material science, to information technology. An example of this is using using molecules to store information, not DNA, because a number of people are working on DNA as a method of storing information. But I think that storing in simple molecules is a much more promising way to go. But um, we'll see in the course of 20 years whether that works out or not. It takes a, a while. A question in historical perspective. By the time you got involved in NMR spectroscopy, did it already seem to be a mature field, or do you feel like you were really part of the beginning of using this technology? Um, it was a mature field. Now it was a field which everyone accepted as a vital part of chemistry. That was proton NMR spectroscopy, and carbon was reasonably well accepted. But then all these other things, you know, the applications in biology and time-dependent methods and CAT scanning and things of that sort. They were all either research or advanced forms of physics and quite new and very unusual in, in their possibilities for chemistry or medicine or whatever. What have been some of your most significant uh, areas of research within the, the field of polymers? Well, Polymers. The, probably the most important stuff has been polymer surface chemistry. We've done a lot of work always on surface chemistry over the period of time. And we, in thinking about polymers at the very beginning, we wanted something that we could do that other people were not working on or not working on in very productive ways. And so we chose surface chemistry. And from that came the work. We did a chunk of work on polyethylene surface chemistry which came when one takes a piece of polyethylene film and uses conventional chemistry to oxidize the surface. And then you take the surface groups that you introduce by oxidation and do chemistry with them. And that seems like a very simple idea, and it is, but it actually lead, led to a lot of information about surfaces. George, tell me about some of your motivations to become involved in public policy issues in Washington, D.C. One of the things which we've done from the beginning, I've done from the beginning, is to try to provide a scientific point of view to things that people are interested in who are not scientists. And public policy is certainly one of them, and that is public health, it's biowarfare, it's a bunch of other things that one wants to do. And you find that the people who go to Washington, some of the people who have jobs in Washington are breathtakingly smart and some are not. Many of the people who go to Washington just because they're donating time and expertise and knowledge and skill are just extremely competent, extremely bright people. And I would go cheerfully, would have gone cheerfully, went cheerfully just to talk to those people. And they were, of course, very interested in having me around somebody because I was a bright youngster and they could do something with some of what they'd learned. And so I learned, just learned a staggering amount from being involved in things that go on in, in committees in Washington, how to run committees, the subject matter of the committees, how the people thought about things. I mean, all of the usual things that a young person learns from those who are older and more experienced. George, your interest in, in climate science and, and energy efficiency how far back does that go? Does that go back to even the 1980s when scientists started to ring the alarm bell about climate change? Well, we don't do very much with climate change, but the the basic notion is that whatever solution there is going to be to any problem has to be economically sensible. So we can't say it's a terrible thing to do and all one has to do is to put up a vast collection of diamonds around the earth at 50,000 feet and have them reflect air. How do you do that? How do you do whatever you're going to do economically? So actually, I'm. this touches on a sensitive point, and I'm trying to think now of sensible ways of teaching graduate students how to do economics in a way that is effective, but doesn't take a staggering amount of time and doesn't require them to be economists to do it. And I haven't really tried the experiments yet, but we'll, we'll get to it soon. George, you've taught so many generations of undergraduates. 
How have things changed for them in terms of their interests, their talents, their motivations? Well, many of the undergraduates that have take organic chemistry historically have been people who are going on to be medical students. And uh, you can argue the correctness of that choice, but there's no question that having smart people involved in medicine in appropriate ways is a very good thing for all of us, especially as you grow older. So how have things changed? It's easy to understand that, of course, while you're taking it, it's difficult and takes time and whatever. But I've been struck by the fact that students that I see periodically coming back, they say, oh, you took the organic chemistry course that I took. And I want you to know that as a result of that, the med chem course that I took in wherever I happen to be in medical school has turned out to be a case, piece of cake because I know a lot all about it. And I think that's what chemistry can do for that group of students. Now, there are other students who are going to be material scientists who need to know something about polyethylene and polystyrene and polysilicones and things of that kind. So it varies with the field. And I think a good course teaches the basics of what are required to understand as a chemical and as a material the things that that field works with. George, for all of the graduate students that you've mentored, what are the rough proportions of those who have gone on to industry, to academia, and to government service? What does that breakdown look like? I don't know. I mean, I haven't done it. I've thought about doing it, but I haven't done it to this point. I would say most of them have gone to uh, either one form of academia or one form of company. And I would guess it's roughly 50-50, but I'm not sure. Not very many have gone straight to Washington to do what they're, whatever they choose to do in Washington. But some have ended up there. Of all of the successful careers that they've pursued, what have been some of the commonalities? What is the platonic ideal of a graduate student in your group who has done great things? Well, a graduate student, remember, in most of science, a graduate student is a way stepping stone to being a postdoc. And as an undergraduate, you learn the periodic table. As a graduate student, you learn how to be a really good technician. And then as a postdoc, you learn how to be a scientist. And there's a, a difference between these three stages. And uh, I would say that what happens is that people go on and they evolve their own style as they go on. And you can't necessarily tell the stage that I'm working at who's going to be good at what. So people who are curious and smart and hardworking and self-directed will come up with something interesting. And people who are basically not that collection of things will have a harder time. But they may change over the course of some years and become outstanding in their own way, too. George, what have been some of your key contributions in biotechnology or drug design or drug delivery? In that area, I would say it's probably understanding something about why biology, why life occurs in water. So the hydrophobic effect and things of this kind, which the community is not particularly interested in, but I'm very interested in. And then the issues having to do with how do you interfere with some forms of viruses? Have you been involved in COVID-19 research? No. Well, the answer to that is Yes, we've been involved in viruses that are very much like COVID-19, but we haven't done, we don't have a program in COVID-19. Tell me about your increasing interest in origin of life. How did you get involved in that field? That's one of the big questions in, in science, in my opinion. For you, it's relatively straightforward as a consequence of work by uh, a number of people to come up with the chemicals that are required for life, but then how those mix spontaneously and spontaneously generate structures, whatever they might be, that become, after 100,000 years, become alive, become us. We really don't know, don't know how that happens. And I guess the most popular theory right now is somehow this mixture of chemicals becomes RNA and then the RNA does something and it becomes the basis for a living vesicle. But whether that's true or not, I can't tell you because we don't have the evidence. Do you see that mystery along the same lines as the creation of the universe itself, something from nothing? 
Oh, probably not. I'm not the person to judge what the physicists do about something from nothing. But something, life from nothing, is a, basically a chemical question. And then the nature of the life is a biological question. So it's a wonderfully important subject, but it also has the interesting characteristic that if we pursue um, the origin of life from the point of view of animals and whatever they might be, what you're getting to is self-improving matter. And if we could understand that, it would have applications all over. So it's a really interesting subject from that point of view. Among the competing theories about how life originated on Earth, what seems most plausible to you as of now? I wish I could answer that question. The theory that most people accept is an RNA world of one or another fashion. So you start out and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and sugars and phosphates and whatever end up making something that's a copolymer, a random copolymer of these. And then that develops, as we know RNA does, um, interesting reactions which lead to replication and lead to mutations. And the mutations eventually lead to somehow a, an organism that uh, then goes ahead and replicates. And you can sort of see the structure of that idea as being as containing the right pieces. Whether those pieces are really what went on is anybody's guess at this stage. And the people who believe in the RNA world would disagree with me. They would say that we have enough evidence to say it's RNA world, but not to me. Has your interest in origin of life studies pulled you into astrobiology to some degree? Not astrobiology. The subject that's, to my mind, more relevant is complexity. So how do you get a simple system to become complex and self-regulating or self-improving or changing in some way spontaneously? So I'm very interested in complexity, but it's a quite difficult subject. And unfortunately, it involves a fair amount of mathematics, and many of the people who go into chemistry, go in because unlike physics, it's not a strongly mathematical field, it's a strongly empirical field. And empiricism is good too, because if something happens, it happens. So it meets one of the criteria for science. It gives something firm to start from. If we do discover life elsewhere, Mars, the icy worlds, an exoplanet, do you think that question will clarify or at least help to arrange our understanding of how life could have originated on Earth? It would be wonderful to see another example, you know. It would certainly help. It would also raise problems that people have raised, the, uh, um, what is it called, the three-body problem. The, the notion of if we find something that leads from randomness to life and life turns out to be common in the universe, do we advertise where that we are here or do we keep quiet about it? And that's a subject which is a policy point of a very deep sort, but it's not really relevant because we don't have any examples yet to worry about. George, what have been some of the key advances in instrumentation over the course of your career? Crystallography, microscopy, or anything else that really stands out in your memory? Well, Spectroscopy in general has been, it, if you look at it now and look at it 50 years ago, it's not the same field at all. It just involves looking at various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and seeing what you can see. And so it's enormously more powerful now than it was. Techniques like high resolution mass spectroscopy are again, enormously powerful and very complicated in terms of instrumentation. And that field has gone leaps and magnitudes in that direction. Interestingly, and for reasons that they don't understand, ESR has not made as much progress. It's gone as far in terms of the technical developments of the field, but in terms of applications, there doesn't seem to be quite as much that one can do about it. And then all of the optical spectroscopies have been enormously you know, enormously productive in what they can do, particularly the things that go to very small scales right now. So there are key elements of looking at at the, the micro world and nano world and are doing very well, along with electron microscopy and the other forms of small scale spectroscopy. 
George, you're a prolific author, writer of scientific papers. What have you learned in terms of efficiency to, to pump out papers at the volume that you have? Well, we don't pump out papers. We actually go, I regret to say, relatively slowly with them. But I, I have come to believe that the ability to write clearly and to speak clearly are important parts of thinking clearly. And so they go along with the rest of science in being a part of the toolkit that a scientist has to have. And so we spend a lot of time learning how to write. We being me and the students together spend a lot of time learning how to write. What have been the most important funding agencies to support your research? Oh, NSF has been important. DARPA has been important. DOE has been important in its way. NIH at various stages in my career has been important. It's been most of them. I mean, as a scientist, one goes where there's money and where, for whatever reason, the peer review community seems to be at least partially um, on your side. And that varies from field to field and time to time. What about private organizations, corporations, individual benefactors? Has that been important to support your research? Well, you know, these corporations have provided some amount of money at various times, but it hasn't been in the greater scheme of things. It hasn't been a key part of the story. Well, George, let's go back, develop some history now. I'll go back to Louisville, Kentucky. First, tell me a little bit about your parents and where they're from. They're both Midwesterners. They were both Midwesterners. And my father in particular was a chemical engineer. And he started a small company when during the depression. And then this company basically worked in, in polymers during a period in which the chemical industry was producing an explosion of new amines and new epoxides. He would buy the ones that were, I guess, out of date and mix them together and figure out what they were good for. And so he made coatings that went on the insides of silos and went on billiards and billiard balls and billiard pins, wherever there was a lot of hard impact, he made polymers to resist corrosion and to resist impact. And he was he was a you know very classical inventor. What was his academic training? He went to college in in uh, Cornell, and I think that was pretty much it. So what he learned, he learned on the job mostly. Did he involve you in his work when you were a boy? Did you understand what it meant to be a working chemist? Well, when I was a teenager, I would work in summers as a technician in the company, in the laboratory. And so I was involved in measuring pore point viscosities and producing lots and lots of glassware that was covered with black slime at the end of the day, and then I would wash it off. So I learned very well how to wash dishes. And then I learned the virtues of keeping clean records and record books and you know all the things that the scientist is supposed to do. And I'm very grateful that he didn't teach me these things. I mean, he was off and running the company, but the guy who was the head of the laboratory uh, was pretty strict about it. And I found it very useful over the course of time. George, you would have been very young, but do you have any memories of World War II? I have some very fragmented memories. I mean, I remember when the bomb was dropped, my parents were very excited. I didn't understand any of the context beyond that. What neighborhood did you grow up in? Was it urban, rural? It was a sort of a mixture. It was a suburb of Louisville, Kentucky. And so we had a perfectly pleasant house and the neighborhood, the neighborhood was quiet and, and um, not difficult to live in at all. Was it segregated? I don't think it was segregated by law. It was primarily a white, a white neighborhood. Growing up, did you have interactions with African Americans? Were they at your schools? Not many, some, but not many. Tell me about the decision to go to Phillips Andover. That was a, um, a very interesting phenomenon. What happened at one point was that one of the, I had 
started schooling at something called the Anchorage, which was in the town of Anchorage, Anchorage Country Day School. And then at some point in that, I had gone to a country day school in Louisville. And one of the teachers in that school, who I'd never had, called up my parents and said, um, my name is, whatever his name was, and I need to come and talk to you. And, you know, parents' heart goes pump, 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 flutter, flutter when somebody wants to talk about a child. But he came out in due course, and what he said is, you've got to get your kid out of here your kid meeting me and he had arranged for me to be admitted to Andover and it was just a question of whether I would go or not and I was happy to go and my parents were willing to let me go and so off I went and that's how I ended up going to Andover and it was a wonderful time I loved being alone I loved having a room to myself I loved many things about that particular environment and so it was all in all a very good experience. Were you oriented towards science even then? In other words, entering Harvard, did you know that's what you wanted to focus on? No. I thought, in fact, I wanted to be a mathematician. But we were required at that point uh, to go to the department chairman of the department. We wanted to to major in and explain that we wanted to be an X, whatever X was. And so I went to the department of chairman and said that I wanted to be a mathematician. And he said, fine, may I ask you a couple of questions? And I said, of course, sir. And he said, you know, the questions were, do you like your exams? Do you work hard in them? Do you get good grades? Do you like your homework? Do you work hard? You know, the usual sort of questions. And my answers were what you would expect, which was that I found the questions hard, but I enjoyed working on them and I got basically good grades. And so it was all fun. And he looked at me and he said, forget it. I said, you know, forgive me. And he said, the best that can happen to you is that you end up as an applied mathematician and you've got better things to do with your life than that. But what he meant was I really didn't have the wherewithal that is required to be a mathematician. And he's He's right. I mean, I don't, I like empiricism. I like facts that are based on something I can see and touch and feel and in principle taste. <clears throat> and um, uh, I'm, I still love mathematics, but I can't say that I've ever regretted not becoming a mathematician. Was it a professor or a particular course at Harvard that turned you on to chemistry? No, chemistry was always very easy for me. So I, I have a visual memory, so I remember things by looking at them. And then washing dishes and stuff like that, I like doing. So I tell my wife periodically that I enjoy washing dishes and I've washed far more dishes than she ever has. And she tells me, you know, a polite way to fuck off. And, <laughs> you know, we get along very well on that basis. <laughs> George, were there any professors as an undergraduate at Harvard that you considered a mentor or you became close with? No. That wasn't the culture? I don't know if it was the culture or not. It wasn't, it wasn't for me. I mean, I, I took the standard array of courses and enjoyed some and didn't enjoy others, and it was all fine. What were some of the lab courses that proved formative in your development? I don't think any were really formative. I, you know, the, probably the most important lab course I took was the physical chemistry laboratory, of course, because that was involved in understanding the, the limits to how closely you can know a number. And that's always a good thing for a scientist to know. And then the organic laboratory course uh, was right next to reality. You, you know, we made compounds and we crystallized them and we did things like that and they caught fire. And so it sort of simulated what people do as graduate students. And so when I went from Harvard to, to uh, Caltech, I was pretty well familiar with the standard techniques that you use for, for chemistry. That is, I was a good technician at that point. And then uh, I learned something different as a graduate student. As an undergraduate, what did you do during the summers? Did you have lab work? 
I had, what I did was to get one of those, um, I had a working relationship with one of the guys who was a, a uh, electric chemist. And so I would work in his lab over the summer, at least some of the time I did. And that was interesting because uh, he sort of didn't know what I was doing. And um, you learn a lot by doing it yourself. Was there a particular moment where you felt confident that you wanted to go on to graduate school, or did that seem like a foregone conclusion from the beginning for you? It seemed like a foregone conclusion. Where were you considering? What kind of advice did you get about people to work with or programs to apply to? Oh, I got such a range of advice that it didn't form any sort of pattern in my mind. But I thought I wanted to get away from the East Coast. That meant the West Coast. And I originally applied to Berkeley. And they lost my application, I think. I mean, I, I never heard back from them. And as time went on, I would write them little letters saying, you know, I applied in September and I haven't heard anything from you since. Uh, am I admitted or not admitted? And they were never answered. And so eventually I just wrote to Caltech and said, look, I have a fellowship and I have no place to go. Can I come? And Caltech said yes, more or less immediately. And so that's how I ended up at Caltech. Now, did you know of John Roberts before you got to Caltech? No. I mean, it was a name that I'd, I'd seen, but I didn't know anything about him. What about reputationally? Did you know about chemistry at Caltech at all? No. What were your impressions when you first arrived in Pasadena? What sticks out in your memory? Small. I my, got off the airplane, and by the time I finished doing what I already did, took a, taking a taxi cab, my eyes were tr streaming tears, and that was just the smog of that day. This was in 1960. Do you remember so, thinking at all, perhaps, that chemists might have a solution? No, I was primarily concerned with finding someplace to sleep. <laughs> yeah, so, and I don't know how I did that, but I did it. How well prepared were you in terms of the kind of chemistry you wanted to pursue at Caltech? I didn't have any kind of chemistry I wanted to pursue. I wanted to join a research group, and I assumed that I would figure out what was going to happen then when it happened, which is pretty much the way it happened. What was the process whereby you joined Roberts's research group? Well, because of the delay in getting admission, I arrived late and there were no, um, basically the groups were all filled up. And so I went to Roberts and said, look, the groups are all filled up. Can I at least have a bench to work on and sit at while we're trying to straighten this out? And he said, okay. Or I guess maybe Marjorie, Marjorie Casario did. I don't remember who it actually was, which I did for a while. And then eventually... I sort of settled into that group. There wasn't anything very formal about it. It's just I had a bench and I was doing research on things that were interesting to him and he was interested. And so we just kept on going. So it wasn't very formal. What was Roberts working on when you connected with him? What was the research of the group at the time? He was working on a number of things and I don't remember what they all were. But I mean, there were some projects in Greenyard reagents. There were there was work in the Diels Alder reaction, which was a hot topic at that point. There were several mechanistic problems of different sorts. And he also worked on a range of different projects at a time. And so it was a cross section of topics that were interesting to physical organic chemists at that point. Was this your first introduction to M NMR spectroscopy, or you were aware of this back at Harvard? It was my first in, first in contact with NMR spectroscopy. What were your impressions? Did you immediately understand how, how relevant and valuable it could be? You know, I thought it was very, very interesting, but I didn't understand anything about broader implications. How did you go about developing your thesis topic? I did what I was curious about. And one of Robert's great, great advantages was that he didn't really tell me what to do. 
and we would interact in major part through papers so that I would do some piece of research and I would write a paper and I would submit it to him. And then he would go in detail and write notes and ask questions and whatever. And we would go through that process a couple of times. And at the end of that, we'd have a paper and we'd send it off. When did you have enough to defend? Three and a half years, I guess, or three years, I forget what it was. What were the principal conclusions of your thesis? That I could explain how certain green artery agents, the NMR spectra, adopted the the shapes that they had. So you take if you take NMR samples that have the characteristic there are multiple compounds in them and they're exchanging somehow, they're becoming one another, then the lines that characterize each of the ones that's exchanging becomes broad in a characteristic way. And NMR is very good at explaining that broadening. And the way I did it, I wrote a thesis and when I got all finished with the thesis, uh, you know, we this was a, a time when there were not much in the way of computers. We would type it up ourselves and use whiteout and correction tape and all the rest of it. And I recognized the thesis was wrong. So I had come to the wrong conclusion. So I started over. And in starting over, I went down to see some of Hardin McConnell's graduate students and postdocs and said, I've got to understand more about the quantum mechanics of NMR spectra. And can you please help? And one of the postdocs decided this would be amusing to do. And so he helped me understand. And part of what he helped me understand was in the some weird papers from Israel in the physics literature on time dependent Schrodinger equations, density matrix approximations to, to uh, solution is the Schrodinger equation for fast interchanging systems. So I got a grip on that and rewrote the thesis and that was fine. But the thesis, the thesis exam was sort of interesting because I remember that pretty clearly. I walked in and there was the usual exchange of pleasantries. And then the, the person who was the chairman, whoever that was, turned to the group of faculty and said, are there any questions? And Hardin McConnell, who has been one of the smartest people I've ever met, was there and he said, well, let me ask one question. He said, imagine, George, that you have a glass of water in front of you. And I tell you that just before you walked in, the water contained either cubic ice cubes or spherical ice cubes. How would you know which one it was just by looking? And we talked about that for about 15 minutes and I couldn't come up with an answer. I mean, I, I can do a better job of it now, but I couldn't at that point come up with an answer. And he didn't know what the answer was either. He was just asking because this was a time where he was very interested in time reversal phenomena. And after a while, somebody got up and left because they had another appointment and then somebody else got up and left after they had another appointment. That was the end of the exam. That was, so we never did talk about the thesis. <laughs> what were you considering at that point? Did you have faculty offers, postdoc appointments? What were your options at that point? I had a faculty offer from MIT and I trundled off to there. And I got that, I think, by having Roberts call up Art Cope, who was the department chairman, and say, um, don't ask too many questions, just hire him. And that was the way we went. Were postdocs not that common back then? I think they were not that common. I, I don't know for sure. I never really considered a postdoc. But um, there didn't seem to be as many of them in Robert's group. I mean, my group now is essentially all postdocs. And I think at that point, Roberts, I think, had very few couple, but you know, they were sort of peripheral to the, the main function of the group. So I think they were, it was a, a perfectly legitimate way of going about things. Many people went that way, but I didn't. 
So you really didn't go out on the job market. You didn't apply for multiple positions. Well, I applied for multiple positions and I got a couple of offers. But one was to MIT and I wanted to go to Boston anyway. I thought that was a neat place to go. So off I went. That was enough of the West Coast for you. It was enough of the West Coast. That's right. Also, I didn't get any offers, I don't think, from the West Coast. Made it easy. I sort of, sort of forgotten this part of my life, but it's a while ago. Tell me about setting up the lab at MIT, 1963. What was that like? Well, it was um, it, something that turned out very well. At the time, it seemed peculiar. I got there, and they didn't have any space for me. And... Um, after a while, this resolved in such a fashion that I shared a large undergraduate laboratory, a large laboratory that had been an undergraduate laboratory, had been converted into a research laboratory for a guy named um, House. And he very kindly said, you can use, I could use unused benches in this laboratory. And what was wonderful about that was that um, he had a bunch of senior students and I think a couple of postdocs. And so they were very good at teaching my initial students beginning stuff about chemistry as well. And so I sort of shared first year graduate students with, with Herb House and his students were as active as mine and teaching the beginning students how to do things. And it was all in all a very effective way of doing things. They had lots of instruments. They let me use them and they maintained them. And it was very generous on Herb's part and very effective on, from my point of view in getting the group started. George, was your lab initially narrowly focused or when, when did you begin to have such a, a broadly conceived research agenda? Well, it began when I had a larger group because you can't have 20 projects if you have five students. So the group started at, you know, maybe five people, I don't remember, and then went on from there. And it was not really until I got to Harvard that I started working on a lot of different things at the same time. So what were the key things that you worked on at MIT, the major areas of research? Organometallic chemistry. And that was pretty much it. We did, we did a whole batch of stuff on using enzymes to do organic synthesis. And that also works out quite well. And was this mostly fundamental research? Did you see any opportunities for application? Well, certainly in the biochemistry there was. So we could, in principle, make things that other people couldn't make and do it in a reasonably efficient way. But, you know, you compare it with the way things are done now and there's nothing so there's very little trace of this work left. People do still use some of the enzymatic methods. And uh, the pharmaceutical industry in particular has become very accepting of any method that works. So the people who really, really understand pharmaceutical chemistry, putting together complex molecules, are the chemical engineers in the pharmaceutical industry because they use any technique from any field to accomplish what they want to do, and they do it very well. You mentioned all of the advances in spectroscopy over the course of your career. What about in those first few decades when you became a faculty member? What were some of the advances then? I do remember we were mostly focused on, on NMR spectroscopy. So we didn't use a wide variety of different methods. When did computers enter the scene? Do you have a memory of when the first computer landed in your laboratory? I think the first real computer was was bought by one of my secretaries who wanted to do writing letters and things like that. Giselle Weiss, who was, remember when I hired her, um, one of the letters for recommendations said, she is the best secretary you will ever have. You know, and she was. And so she at one point came and said she wanted to buy a, whatever kind of computer she wanted to buy for instrumentation. I didn't think about it too much, except that the bill was quite high. It was, you know, $20,000 or $25,000 in those days was a fair amount of money. But she put it to good use. It was a fairly big operation. And she could get things done very efficiently, and that started me off in the right direction. 
George, was it at MIT that you got involved in polymer research? Yes, it was at MIT. It was more at Harvard, but at MIT. And it was uh, the general issue was that the most common polymer used in um, well everywhere is polyethylene. And so my question was, it's also the simplest polymer from a chemical point of view. So why not just focus on that? And that's where we began to work by changing the surface chemistry of the polyethylene film, since you could buy polyethylene film for almost nothing in gigantic quantities, and explored what the relationship was between the surface chemistry and the surface properties. And that was a very good introduction to the material science of surface polymers, surface modified polymers. What about biology? Was it at MIT that you started to interact with biologists? Mm, it was really at, more at Harvard. And I, we got involved in it because it was an adjunct of polymer chemistry. A lot of biology is polymers. And there was a guy named Don Wiley, who was a very good virologist, who was interested in some of this stuff. And so we started to collaborate with him and that evolved into a project on flu virus, which was where we focused much of our attention at the beginning. Tell me about the origins of the so-called Cory House Posner Whitesides reaction. Well, we, when I was um, deciding what I would do when I got out of Caltech, one of the things that attracted me was catalysis. And a lot of catalysis in the industry is done using metals as catalysts. And I thought that probably an organic molecule had served on a metal surface was like an organic molecule with a coordinated metal in solution. So I would study those and see what they did instead, which we did with great length with, with platinum. But um, the, you know, the underlying idea was to look at the soluble organometallic chemists and see if they chemists, chemicals, and see if they did the same sort of chemistry that you see in heterogeneous catalysis and then draw appropriate conclusions from that. And we found all sorts of interesting things about chemical reactivity this way, but not very close connections between the surface reactions and the solution reactions. Was it polymer research that got you more thinking about applications, even even commercial applications? No, I don't think so. I think it was just a general feeling that, you know, coming from the Midwest, you pay your debts. And if people are going to pay for your research, you ought to give them something back in return. Also, I have to say that applications of things lead to lots and lots of opportunities and new problems to think about. So one of the best ways of of going off in new directions is often to think about what you do with what you do with the old directions. And so it's been thinking about applications has been very stimulating scientifically as well as being practically useful. You mentioned that of course you need a larger research group to have a more broadly conceived research agenda. Did that happen for you at MIT? Was the group quite large by the time you decided to leave for Harvard? It was pretty big. It was probably 20 people or something like that. And I moved, they all moved to Harvard. So I had the same group to start with there. What was the decision? Why move to Harvard? Oh, you were say it was partially change of scenery. I still love MIT. But and I love it primarily because it manages to integrate engineering and science in many areas, not all areas, but many areas almost seamlessly. But um, I, th I thought in my naivete that at Harvard, I wouldn't find that everyone was learning how to do um, solutions to Maxwell's equations in their head and that there would be some increased stimulation that would come from working with people who were in the humanities and things of this sort. And I've, that's probably true, but I've never managed to find it myself. So you thought that Harvard in, encouraged more interdisciplinary research? No, I thought that Harvard encouraged more humanities research, which is true. 
And you moved the entire group. I moved the entire group, yeah. What was that like going back to your alma mater? Were any of your old professors there still? Uh, many of them were, yeah. And they had not known me as undergraduates, and they didn't know me as an assistant professor, and that was fine. The general assumption was I was just a postdoc for Herb House. <laughs> now, you said at Harvard, Harvard was really when you got more involved in a broader area of research. Yeah. In, in what way? What caused that? The problem has got to be broader. As you do research, more problems crop up rather than fewer problems, more problems get solved. So your your range of problems to work on goes up rather than down. And so as a big research group of smart students working on a lot of different problems produced even more problems to work on, which meant even more people working on more different areas and more different applications. Tell me about your decision to become chair of the chemistry department. Oh, there wasn't really much of a decision. Somebody came to me at some point and said, will you be chair? And I said, yes. And I had learned enough in Washington about how to run committees and how to do things of that sort that I, it was never a particularly difficult job. So already, even in the 1980s, you were involved in things in Washington, D.C.? Yeah. I mean, Washington at that point was very involved in the Cold War. And so they needed people who thought about materials in new ways and thought about new structures and thought about new propulsion methods and whatever. And so there was a fair appetite for young people who had a technical background, and I was just one of many such people. So I did most of my work with DARPA. DARPA was very welcoming, and they had a number of other bright young people, and we all got together and taught one another various things, and it was a good arrangement. This was not Jason, though. This was a different group. Jason is mostly physics. This was something called the DSRC, which is the Defense Science Research Council. And Jason, I think, is, I mean, Washington has gotten, has made the decision that it's going to eliminate most of these advisory groups, which I think in the long term is a terrible idea for Washington, because it was a very good method of training young people and thinking about things as Washington does and thinking about problems as Washington does. And if you look around, and you're thoughtful, you can find a remarkable number of young people in material science who learned their material science in advisory groups in Washington. Was it at Harvard that you got involved in microfluidics, or that goes back farther? No, that was at Harvard, because we learned how to make microstructures. <laughs> and the obvious question is, what do you do with microstructures? And one thing you do is you run fluids through them. So it's a natural thing to look at. And the rules of micro fluidic science, rheology, apply over a, a very broad range of sizes. So that much of the work, the sort of theoretical work in microfluidics had been done already by people who had done fluidics in oil pipelines and things of that kind. And so it was possible to get a lot done in a short period of time. And there were many surprises in that area, so that's a good thing to do as well. What about surface chemistry, surface physics? Was that also at Harvard when you got involved? Yeah, mostly, although we had started on polyethylene earlier looking at that. But if you think about why adhesion, lubrication, friction, all of these sorts of areas are all surface areas of one or another sort. And it also turns out that if you look at I don't know, a, a carbonated beverage can or something like that, or, or a bottle, plumber bottle. The, the, um, most of the function, the gas resistance comes from the interfaces in various ways. So it's full of neat stuff to think about. And so we got involved in trying to understand if we could make this mm -hmm. rational rather than empirical. And the answer is, you know, years later, the, the answer is yes, you can. So surface science is now surface science. Organic surface science is surface science, not pure empiricism. But companies like 3M that um, did lots and lots of surface chemistry were very good at surface science. There was, so they were also there. 
George, you mentioned it was really at Harvard that you got involved more with biologists. How did that come about? I don't remember. I don't remember. I mean, I just know that it, at a certain point, we were not involved with Don Wiley, and then at some later point, we were working with Don Wiley to try to find things that would inhibit the propagation of influenza virus. And that never got to the point where it made it into the clinic, that particular project, but it taught me an enormous amount of biochemistry, which I had never known before. It was also the case that somewhere in that period, I was I taught my first biochemistry course. And that was with a, a guy named uh, Wally Gilbert, who subsequently went on to win the Nobel Prize in biology. Very, very smart guy and very nice, very pleasant person. So I would go to all his lectures and I don't know what the students learned, but I learned a staggering amount of biology from Wally. Did you get involved with consulting as the biotech revolution was underway? Yeah, I did a number of biotech companies or big companies with biotech components. And so it was a good thing to do. I learned from that as well. George, as your research agenda broadened, what are the decision-making techniques about what to hang on to and what to leave behind completely? How do you do that? Well, different people have philosophies. The one that I have is that what one wants research to be primarily is simple. If you can make it simple, then other people have a relatively low barrier to entry when they think about incorporating one of your techniques. So what we look at is if we get something done, but it requires a massive effort to do it, then we don't spend too much time in that. But if we find some way of doing something that's really, really easy to do, then that's a good thing to focus on. And so a lot of what we've done has had the tendency to be things that were really easy to do because you can make rapid progress that way. Was it at Harvard that you got involved in soft lithography? Yeah. How did that come about? Well, that's, that's part of the story that I was just saying. It's, it turns out to be very simple to do lithography using soft methods. So since it's really simple, why not do more things and see what can be done? And one of the things, for example, you could do is to make the microchannel systems that are used in microfluidics. It's just a natural extension. And so you do that and um, once you've developed the techniques, the application is right there in microfluidics and off we went. And were there startups that, that, that sprung out of this research in particular? Not so much out of microfluidics, but there were companies that have used microfluidics. Actually, microfluidics is quite well used and was used based in part on stuff that came along before we were involved in the field. So it turns out that it's a field that was sort of, it existed, it was scattered, and it benefited from having an academic focus on the subject as such. And we were working at that point with a guy named Howard Stone, who had subsequently moved to Princeton, but he was one of the pioneers of microfluidics and a very, very good microfluids person. And we learned an enormous amount from him. George, in thinking about your service in Washington, D.C., when did you start thinking about pedagogy, education, and American competitiveness? How did that come about? They're different subjects. We have not thought much about pedagogy. It's an enormously important subject, but the point of view that I take is that you've got to find ways of getting people to do things, then they become good at it. It's not a question of the pedagogy, um, teaching them how to do something they wouldn't do otherwise. So I'll tell you a little story about that in a moment, but the underlying subject of when did we talk about that. That's been a subject that's come up periodically. Most of what I've done in Washington has been, we have rocket throat nozzles that burn out in one launch. So what what do we do to make better rocket throat nozzles? It was that sort of question. But I remember um, the in the subject of doing things, learning by doing, 
at one point in this period, I was giving a talk to, I guess it was the incoming PhD, MD, PhD students at Harvard Medical School. And it just happened that by coincidence, the a couple of nights before I was to give this talk, I was having dinner with a bunch of people who were Boston biotech mafia. And I said to them, look, guys, I have to give this talk. What would be the one lesson that you think I should pass on about what the students should learn if they want to become biotech entrepreneurs? And it was interesting that everyone there, myself included, had essentially the same answer, which was that if you're going to become a biotech entrepreneur, the way to do it is not to take courses in being a biotech entrepreneur, but rather to apprentice yourself without salary if necessary to somebody who is a biotech CEO and just follow around afterwards and see what they do. Because the only way you'll learn how to deal with the time where your company is running out of money, you got an offering lined up and the money's just there waiting for you. But just at the point that you are about to announce this offering, the market collapses. What do you do then? And you do that, you learn how to deal with that by watching somebody who deals with it, who has to deal with it, who does deal with it. It's been very effective. And, um, you know, that particular question is to me one of the more interesting questions in pedagogy. Do you actually have courses and things, or do you set up ways for people to learn how to do, learn by doing? And I'm on the learn by doing school. The original concerns that prompted you to get involved in the, the idea of American competitiveness. How did that come about? Well, what do we have to offer as a country? Mm -hmm. We've got very bright people and a range of applications of things, problems that need to be solved. So we have a clear opportunity and we have demonstrated repeatedly that we're really pretty good at this kind of thing or we can be pretty good at it. So we need to learn how to do it. And that's the origin of the interest. It's something which you can do, which we know we are good at. And it's simple enough that you can see what needs to be done. So how does one most efficiently make it happen? And, you know, people who are in business have a point of view. People who are in universities have a different point of view. Nobody is, even now, is in very firm agreement as to how to do this kind of thing. And it's one of the issues the country has to solve as it goes on. One of the questions I will say I'm interested in. Because you've been involved in this for some time, what 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 is the current state of play? Has the United States become more or less competitive overall? Well, the United States has probably become less competitive because other countries have become more competitive. That is, they put more effort into it. The Chinese, for all their real and maybe imagined faults, have put an, an astonishing amount of money into getting a a industrial complex work up and running, which is very good in some parts I and mean, really very good. Um, there's nothing intrinsically different about the Chinese way of thinking about things in the American way. Well, there, there are differences, but there's nothing that's going to dominate whether one is better than the other in the long term competition. But we have to work on it. And if the country develops the point of view that it no longer believes that science is important, and it doesn't believe science anyway, then We've got a problem. I wonder if your vantage point from Harvard, which is in many ways, you know, the global beacon of high, higher education, if that's a useful barometer in terms of the kinds of students who are motivated to come to the United States for their education as opposed to staying home. It's a good question. Uh, certainly the students who my postdocs often want to do startups. They want to be involved in small companies which is fine. But the problem there is that you, all this involves having people and families that have to be paid for and money for materials and supplies. It's a, research is actually a fairly expensive operation. And the country has to decide that it's important to do uh, and then pay for it. Or we have to find some other way of doing it. 
And I think that most of the efforts to get industry involved have not been very successful for a variety of reasons. Have your graduate students and postdocs, have they become more international over the years? Yes. When I was starting, most of the graduate students came from the Midwest and had repaired tractors in their childhood. And now, the, you know, the people who want to come here in droves are Chinese and they were mostly Chinese. A very large number of Chinese want to come. And sometimes they're very, very good students and sometimes they're not so good students. It's, so it's I mean, maybe it's not a difference. Maybe it's, it's a question of learning how to deal with these differences. But there is a difference that the Americans tend to want to be left alone to do what they want to do. And some other countries want to be, students from some other countries want to be told what they do to succeed, what they need to do to succeed. And it's different. You, The question of do you succeed by doing what you want to do or do you succeed by doing what somebody tells you to do is a real difference in science and technology. George, beyond the American context of, of service in, in support of, of, of science policy, where have you had opportunity to serve in an international context, thinking about science across countries, not within them? Not so much. I've been on advisory groups that are German and Swiss and Indian and to an extent Japanese, but um, these have all been fairly, fairly casual. Um, they may have taken a fair amount of time, but they were not deeply involved to just deciding where the money came from and where the money went. So policy, you have to make a distinction between those who think about policy and those who do policy. And um, so I haven't been involved in doing policy in foreign countries. Oh, Taiwan, I'd forgotten about. What about the so-called Whitesides report? Was that exclusive to the UK or that was more general? That was it was intended for the UK, and I think many of the conclusions apply elsewhere. But the basic idea of how should science be organized, and does simplicity count, and you know all those sorts of things, I think it does. Because the university has a tendency to become this self-referential, so you you know you sign up to be in a university and then you work hard in order to get a Nobel Prize or something. Basically, who cares? I mean, your next door neighbor doesn't care. And so you need to decide what standards you're working for. Is it going to be jobs created or academics awards that you won or what is it going to be? And um, I have a my view of that and other people have different views and will you can take your choice from the menu of, of ideas that are out there. But I strongly believe that if my neighbor next door can't understand what I'm doing, then probably I should think of something else to do. George, be in part. because in recent years, particularly, you've been a leading voice in ensuring, as you mentioned, that science really should be more relevant to people's lived realities. What, what debates has that sparked within academia, particularly among professors who might bristle at the notion that fundamental research should have those those motivations? I don't think much. I mean, people do what they do because they think they know what the answer is. And the underlying idea in that is, is fairly deep-seated in, in some examples. And when it constantly comes up is quantum mechanics, it works very well because Schrodinger did quantum theory for his own reasons. And we'll never know what he, they were because he didn't write them down and everyone around him disappeared. But uh, you know, you can find examples of things, but chemistry is an area which is pretty strongly dominated by this idea that um, you do things because other chemists tell you that it's a good idea to do them. And uh, they determine how much money you get and they determine a bunch of other things. And so it's, uh, you. you it's a little bit countercultural to think of things in terms of how directly is it related to something that goes on outside of the lab academic laboratory. Have your ideas gained traction? Have you seen more scientists in academic institutions 
become more willing to take on applied research? I don't know. I mean, how would one ever judge that? And I think you find more schools now that are interested in doing applied research, if you want to put it that way. That is research that is stimulated by solving a problem as opposed to research that's stimulated by the curiosity of the investigator. I think that's a better way of doing it than saying fundamental and implied since that has a sort of a, uh, a value judgment already built into it. So problem solving research or curiosity driven research. And when you say, is it is the current situation better or worse than it was? It's what is your criterion for better or worse? How do you judge? I don't think you can right now. For you personally, what, what were the scientific areas of opportunity that inspired you to think about, you know, becoming more applied, becoming more relevant? Well, I mean, I mentioned one, that being robotics. I think that, that the question of what people have jobs, how many people are there, China is running out of people now. I mean, it's an interesting thing to think of. Chinese population is being uncontrollably large, but it's not as large as the country needs to pay for all the obligations that it's accumulating. And, uh, you know, different countries are different that way, and you need to think about them in, in those terms. But, you know, I just had a bunch of students go over to the UK, and they're working in robotics, and they're doing it because they find it interesting, but also because they, in due course, are probably going to establish their own companies and get things going that direction. And so that may well be at least superficially motivated by money, but I think it's mostly motivated by curiosity. George, to return to the topic of taking on new areas of research, what are the calculations in terms of making sure that you're serving your students well, that a graduate student who comes to you can be confident that they're going to do well because you're knowledgeable, you're an expert in this area. How do you have expertise when, by definition, you're moving into new areas? You don't. That's one of the charming characteristics of science. You actually have to put skin in the game. So the great virtue of being first in something is, as everyone says, if you're first, everyone thereafter works for you. But if you're not first, then you work for them. And you know, you're know you're going off to do something new. You don't know it's going to work. What you know is that nature is very kind. And if you are intelligent and you watch carefully and you try to behave in a way that's really devoted to dealing with the problem you're working on, then your chances are not bad of coming up with something interesting. It may not be what you were looking for, but something interesting. And I think that I think overall the odds are much better for young people to work in things that are curiosity driven problems in which other people are not working and have not worked than to do it the other way around. Is it important to communicate to the students that you're a novice in these areas and there's a certain risk involved? No, I don't think that that serves a major function. I mean, if you pick out a problem like the origin of life, you have to be really almost resistant to new ideas to think that that's something in which the answers are already known. I mean, it's, it's clear that it is a uh, a topic in which the answer is not known. And whether I think it's soluble or not soluble doesn't make a difference. Probably the best answer is that I think it's not soluble, but it's really important. And then you have the motivation to go and do it because it's obviously not going to be trivial for someone else to come and do it for you or do it instead of you. And instead you get the entire field with all of its ramifications to be your own provided that you get there first, which means a lot depends upon your own creativity and perseverance. To turn the nature of the question around, when have students, postdocs, graduate students, been a source of inspiration for you to pursue new areas? When do you look to them for new ideas? Well, they come up with stuff all the time that is new. And sometimes the new things are worthwhile pursuing. So, for example, we were talking about soft lithography. Um, that was soft lithography was invented by 
a pair of Chinese students, Dong Ken and Nunan Xia. And they did so because that was something that came naturally out of the research that they had agreed to work on. But their solutions were their own. And the solutions were better than the problem was. So that if you follow Dong's idea of doing nail lithography using a high resolution printer rather than using a, uh, you know, a, a uh, chrome mask maker or something like that, you can get enormously farther in a short period of time. And she was just very good at coming up at creative solutions to things that were very straightforward. They involved equipment that you could buy off the shelf and it wasn't expensive and the techniques were not complicated and anyone could get involved and do it. So I mean, you know, I think that it is my responsibility to suggest areas that I genuinely think are important or worthwhile doing and doable. But it is their responsibility to come up with innovative solutions to lead to fundamentally new things to do. George, you mentioned the importance of being able to communicate so that your neighbor understands what you're doing. More broadly, what, what opportunities have you had in, in, in being a science communicator, talking about science generally for an audience that's not experts but, but are interested? Well, we, this hasn't been a major part of what I've done, but one thing we have done is we've I have written collaboratively with Felice Frankel a book on interesting phenomena. Now, that book was driven by her selecting pictures and then me coming up with statements of what the problem was that the pictures represented, what the solution was, if there was one. But that's interesting to do, and I've done some of that. And then I've done a lot of stuff which involves writing reviews for the scientific public, if you can put it that way, which does as best I can do, it, explaining what problems there are to be done at a given time or why an area is interesting or things of that sort. But it, this contributes, I think, to the general noise of the background between science, different areas of science and science and society. But nonetheless, it probably leads to something worthwhile in the long term. Have you been surprised in recent years the disconnect between science and society, between conspiracy theories, misunderstanding, even misinformation? Do you see these as new developments or have they always been present? That's a really interesting question. I don't know. The, you know, the issue, obviously, finding conspiracy theories that seem to violate laws of thermodynamics really sets my teeth on edge. I'm a thermodynamics person. I really believe in thermodynamics. But things that basically contravene established scientific fact strike me as a bad idea. It's okay to come up with those but you better have a reason for doing it and you better have very strong empirical evidence to support your point of view. But having said that, there's, you know, there's an entire industry of trying to come up with good ideas about how to do pedagogy and things of this kind. And I don't know where, how do students, how do students learn how to do science or how to look at nature or how to look at phenomena? They don't do it in general from courses. They do it by doing it. So, I mean, what, what I would say is that science, should, science education should involve more opportunities for creative play, if I can put it that way. And much of what goes on in an academic laboratory is creative play. You do it because you're curious and the problems are hard and interesting. And when you come out, there may be something else you can do with it. But it's definitely a, a uh, kind of exercise that doesn't lend itself to learning like a multiplication table does. What have been some of the big takeaways for you in terms of science communication for better or worse during the COVID-19 pandemic about what scientists understand and what they don't and how they should communicate that? Well, one of the positives is that I think there are far fewer people now that are opposed to vaccination than before. I don't think people have any better idea what vaccination does or is about than they did before. And in fact, vaccination is a hard area. And one of the things that to me is a little bit frustrating is that 
if you go to different areas, pandemics are, you know, humanity has always been plagued by pandemics of one or another sort. And you would think that this would provide a counterexample of a, of a technology, there are RNA methods, which makes it possible to actually to make a vaccine um, by design as opposed to doing it by randomly throwing compounds at some subject somehow. And it doesn't seem to be doing that. It doesn't seem to have done that. The, the, the um, anti-science movements of various sorts are still pretty firmly of the opinion that vaccination is bad for you. Now, how do we get over that hump? It's an interesting question. And I would prefer to think that the way you were going to do it is not to have repeated uh, pandemics followed by uh, vaccination stepping in at the last moment to save the day. But I don't see any evidence of it so far. But maybe in Washington, people are, there's a lot of money in Washington, so you can get a lot of stuff done in a short period of time if you've got a good leader to do it. George, more recently, tell me about your decision to give up the university professorship. Is that just a matter of there's other people that should have this honor? Yeah. I mean, the president thought it was a good idea to do. And so it's it's something which um, is okay with me. And if it provides other advantages, greater flexibility to the president and more things that can be done, I'm all for it. But obviously, that doesn't change your day to day. Not so far. We'll see in due course. So this is this is a recent change. It's a recent change. After all, I'm 82, 83 now. And at some point, I'm going to be run over by a bus or struck by a heart attack or something. And the time is growing closer and closer. And I need to think about what happens to these students that are in the group and how you pay for things and how you provide exit supervision and all the rest of these kinds of things. And so this is just part of that whole story. What's the time scale for that in terms of committing to students and making sure that they're properly funded? Well, a postdoc is good for, a postdoc comes and usually spends two or three years in the group. Uh, it may be two to four, depending upon the student, but I mean, most people spend two to three years in the group. Uh, graduate students take usually five years, something of that quarter. I don't take very many graduate students now for at least in part this reason, but the postdocs are definitely people you want to pay attention to. They to me are one of the creams, various forms of cream of society, of the scientific society because they've already been through most of the process of training. And now it's just a question of how do you, how do you stir the sense of curiosity and help them to understand what a good problem is and a bad problem? And are you even right in your own view of this? And, or is it obsolete now that you've gotten old and atherosclerotic? And there are lots of interesting problems there that have to be dealt with. But I think there is an obligation for the people who are getting older to think about the students. And I'm fortunate I have uh, a family that consists of two sons and one wife, all of whom are very concerned with the students and they keep reminding me to pay attention to this problem. Where you see time as an increasingly valuable resource, is it is it the students, that that challenge that seems most precious? Well, the students are, are beginning and the directions they go make a big difference. So if your principal objective is, let's just type this, hypothesize, you go into an academic job and you manage to get a starter grant, is your primary objective to get another starter grant? Um, what, what are you trying to do? Or is your objective to use the starter grant to start something and then go into finding other bigger problems to work on? And this whole question of how you design your own career can only be done by you. Um, and it makes a difference what you decide to do. Because if you decide to work on new problems, that's quite different from working on problems that are just designed to show that you can exercise a skill that someone else has developed. And it's much more interesting to work on your own problems, I think. 
Is the emeritus de designation something that makes sense for you personally? No. How come? For one thing, I plan to keep on running my research group. And, the, you know, in general terms, one of the things that happens at my age is that I feel an obligation to do for the university what I can to benefit it. And it's probably more beneficial to have me operating just as a professor than to have me operating as a retired something. You know, retired suggests that I've lost uh, all my skill in the usual scientific things and I'm just retaining a title. When I leave it up to history to decide whether that turned out turned out to be true or not, but I don't intend it to. So at this point, you don't have any particular time scale. What it would look like to wind down the lab? Well, we'll have to be done in the next five years, or maybe a little bit more than that. I don't know, but it's that period of time. Yes, there is a time that you have to get out and one of the things make space for younger people. So in those five years, do you have a game plan? What's most important to accomplish? I can just walk out. I mean, the things that I'm working on is problems like the origin of life. I don't know that I'm going to be finished in five years. The way things are going right now, I'm not. And, you know, some of the others are the same way. So they will keep going. But if I'm not making progress and not coming up with new ideas, I'm actually quite qualified to judge that myself. But that's probably always been true in your career, making those decisions. Yeah, but it, it's a difference of whether I have, I can look backwards over five years and then look forward over 20, or whether I can look backwards over five years and look forward over five. So there is a real difference in what demography tells you, and that different demography is fundamentally an empirical art. You see what's happened to other people. Yeah. Well, George, we're right, so, up, well, yeah. we're right yeah, up to the ahead. present. We're right up to the present. So for the last part of our discussion, if I may, some overall retrospective questions about your career, and then we can yeah. end looking to the future. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to burden you with the discussion of all of the awards and honors that you've experienced over your career. But what, if any, have been most meaningful, either as an opportunity for you to talk about science or that have been just most personally satisfactory to you? We're not going to do that because I can't actually answer the question. I mean, it is not the case that one has been particularly relevant and another has been particularly irrelevant. Some have been irrelevant and some have been, I mean, I'm happy to get them, but there's no point in, all are well intended and there's no point in trying to make distinctions between them. So you have to come up with another question. <laughs> Well, what about the opportunity, for example, the Priestley Medal comes with an opportunity to give an address. Have you right. found utility in being reflective and to communicate what you've tried to do when you get an award like that? Utility, utility only happens uh, when you look in retrospect at what other people have done. Have people who heard the Priestley Address, um, would they necessarily go off and do something different than what they've done before. And I don't know how you judge that. Yeah. Even if you could get that information. So I think I'm one of a number of people who make the point that science should pay its own bills um, by, by thinking at least in part about issues like climate change and global warming and whatever. What can we contribute to this? And there are a lot of clever people doing that. So more power to them. Um, but the, the underlying notion of just an award. I think it's an open question as to whether awards serve a useful function. What they do do without question is to show the person who gets the award and shows the community that they are somehow picked out for having done something of notice. And that's good because we don't have the kind of thing that a corporation has of having an identified list of fast movers and things of that sort. But the other question of whether it actually influences the course of research or not, I don't know. Do you think that there's validity to a cynical perspective that it does motivate people because they want the recognition? Oh, you know that that's true. I don't think there's anything cynical. I don't think it's even 
a bad idea because after all, you work for an A in freshman chemistry or you know, first year mathematics or whatever it is that you're doing. So some form of recognition is in a corporation, you do it in terms of P&L statements. How do you do it in, in a university? How do you even tell whether you're doing the right kind of thing? And at least in part, it's are you making an, an impression on the world? And if you are impressing the scientific community, that doesn't really mean very much. But it's a step toward impressing the, the broader world because if the scientific community is, is impressed, then they go off and do some of what you've done and maybe they'll do something that changes the world. I mean, I, th I think it all ties together in a way. But I don't know that the awards are a critical part of that. What scientific societies have been most important for you professionally within chemistry? Well, I guess the answer is that the ACS provides a sort of a core skeleton for thinking about chemistry in a variety of ways. The, the National Academy has assorted committees on various subjects, some of which write reports and are, are quite interesting and influential. Things like DARPA have made a very big impression on me as I've gone along. Um, you know, and, and they are with a different function altogether. But I think the key issue is that the, the, the society or whatever should have it as its primary objective to promote the flow of knowledge or the development of new knowledge in the field. So IEEE has done a very good job of this as far as I can tell. ACS has done maybe a less good job because it's got an enormously broad uh, spectrum of stuff to work on. And you can make your way through the others sort of picking and choosing, but the picking and choosing is based on idiosyncratic information and may not be of much use. Of all of your service in a public policy context, you've mentioned already it's difficult to, be a, to, to measure impact. Have you seen the way that some of your ideas have, have changed policy for the better? Change policy. I'm not actually even sure what that means. Um, there are a lot of people, let's take an example, a lot of people who do soft lithography and SAMs and things of this sort. And the agencies have responded by funding some, some of these activities. Is that changing policy? I mean, it's changing the peer review system. And you can make an argument that the peer review system needs to be re-examined, but there's no point in examining it unless you have a better idea. And the peer review system has its faults, but it also serves a function of putting the decisions about scientific priorities in the hands of scientists rather than in the hands of Congress, which is, I think, a good idea. And you can, you know, you can make prolonged disquisitions on the subject of who should decide what for what in what field, but I don't know it's very very helpful to do. I mean, Vannevar Bush made a big contribution with the Endless Frontier, but um, I don't know anything that's made a bigger impression except for, I will say, um, material science is an odd field and it's the only field that I know, only academic field that I know that has been made up in real time. It was made up by the government agency, so it was a public policy thing. And I give DARPA a lot of credit for that. So there is an example of the way they did it was to pay for research, which they thought would lead to um, solutions to problems that they had. But you know, if somebody would, would come up with good ideas as to what um, the scientific community should do to deal with climate change, I'm sure that scientists would go and do it because Scientists are commonly, constantly looking for things to do that are worthwhile problems. But I don't think anyone's come up with a good idea. George, in recent years, there's been such an emphasis on increasing diversity and inclusivity in the science. 
I wonder what your perspective on this is, where that came from and what its impact has been so far. Well, I think I'm completely for it. And I think that uh, part of the trick in that is to understand this issue of what do people want to do? Because if your inclusivity, your idea for inclusivity is to sweep in black, Hispanic, whatever it is, students, and have them write academic papers that get published in FizzRev letters, uh, it's not clear they want to do that. I mean, why would you want to do that? If it's the idea is to, I don't know, start companies and, you know, sell things and make money and do whatever, that may be closer to the the, the thought. But I think a lot of the idea of, of people getting together and and deciding for others what they want to do and should want to do is misdirected. So what may be good for me as a member of one sector of society may not at all be good for somebody who's from a different sector of society. And we need to find ways, not so much of providing opportunities for people as providing a sympathetic understanding that people are different and have different things in mind when they're doing things. What I would do with inclusivity is to provide provide opportunities for people to go off in a variety of directions, which led to better jobs and more interesting lives. But that's not necessarily being a a technician for a pharmaceutical company or something of that sort. That isn't necessarily what I want to do if I'm uh, with some backgrounds. And so we have a group of people in society who's trying very hard to solve a problem, which I think is a good and legitimate thing to do, whether they've got the most efficient way of doing it or whether they're trying to impose on the problem, their point of view, if they were the problem is another question that I'm less certain of. George, what about the specific issue of providing access to underrepresented groups to make sure that they have the opportunities to succeed in the kind of environment like like your lab at Harvard? I'm completely for it. How are you going to do it without money? And people are beginning to pay attention to that, but the you know the underlying idea that you say that you need to provide access and you figure out the details of how to do that is not going to work. If you can think about all the students that you've mentored, all the great things that they've gone on to do, what stands out in your memory? I don't know if proud is the right word, but when you look at what one or more of your students have done and you feel really good about whatever role you played, I wonder if you can reflect on that. Well, it's difficult to reflect without, in some ways, going to be a public document. But there is, I mean, one of my students who was a, a um, young black man has become one of the best venture guys I know and is doing an excellent job in running his venture firm. And I hope that he eventually makes a lot of money and gets ahead in the world and changes things. He finds it very interesting to do this. Another one was the CTO of DuPont for a while. And it was a woman, in fact. And you can find others who've gone off and done interesting jobs. And then I'm, I'm pretty much a radical feminist, so I'm a big admirer of having women do all sorts of things because I think they make for better research groups and better research and better ideas and just all sorts of other stuff. When you have a bunch of high testosterone young males uh, floating around a the laboratory, there tend to be um, there tend to be tensions, and better off not to do that. So I, th- I think there are lots that can be done. So I think it's a doable problem with money and with effort, but I think it's, it requires both money and effort. And sympathy for sympathetic reading of people's intentions and what they really want to do. And the fact we want inclusion doesn't necessarily mean that the people who want to be included want our view of what inclusion is. For all of the new research areas that you ventured into where you embraced being a novice, 
Do you regret any of those research turns? Or even if none worked, a particular one didn't work out, there's value in that experience as well? Well, the value in any experience may not crop up for 10 or 20 years. An interesting area that we've worked in recently has been magnetic levitation. So how do we how do we use a magnetic field gradient to lift or not lift heavy weights or light weights? And you can do some really interesting things. For example, we can separate fentanyl crystals from meth crystals in very small quantities uh, to enable their identification. And that's an example of something you can do. But it's a very specialized example. And the general issue with, with um, um, this kind of um, technology, analytical technology, excuse me for a moment. Um, how much longer are you? It's not so long. Quarter of three. Yeah, you told yeah. me that a while back. So it's not so long. This is a fresh conference. This is the one with Caltech. Oh, great. Oh, okay, I'll be clean. Yeah, you've got to finish that. Okay. That's important. Thank you, ma'am. I'm glad they're getting to interview you. I want to, I want to uh, see the results. Okay. Yeah. I'll change my shoes. Okay, and I'll change mine. My wife, that was my wife, and she was hit by a car a couple of, let's see, a year or two years, so it's probably closer to two years ago now, and broke both legs. And so I go with a walk, a walk with her every afternoon um, to sort of get the muscles loosened up and accelerate the rehab. And the uh, she was just asking when it was going to be finished to so she could plan accordingly. Well, I don't want to get in the way of that. So, so George, only a few more questions to wrap up. Right. What are you most proud of in terms of fundamental discovery in chemistry? Where do you see your, your most important legacy and what you've accomplished? You still use fundamental. What do you mean? Understanding how nature works. Mm, is, is that curiosity driven? Yes. What have you discovered? Simple as that. Probably the self-assembled monolayer work is the most widely used. It's part of the democratization of science because anyone can do nanotechnology with self-assembled monolayers and come up with really good results that way with almost no effort. And that's interesting. And that was done in collaboration with Ralph Nuzzo, who is a very good scientist who's also worked on the problem and who actually I think was, I put him as number two in the line of people who discovered and rediscovered self-assembled model errors. Number one was, was 3M. And then what about on the application side or the translational side? What are you most proud of there? Well, you know, that's again a complicated question. The one area or the one company that has produced stuff that is widely used is uh, what well, was originally Joltex and it became um, it became whatever it was that the name will come to me in a moment. I've forgotten. Anyway, it makes material for kidney failure and it's widely used uh, today to as a substitute for more extreme procedures and the reason it works is that it you know it simply is a simple polymeric method of sopping up phosphate from the the uh, urine and preventing it from being excreted in the wrong fashion but soft robotics is also doing well and it has served a real need is serving a real need in food manipulation or manipulation of soft objects in general. And we're working on others right now for memory, secure memory for computers and things of that kind. So there, there, at any given time, there are three or four of these that are going. And I can only really tell you after 20 years and see what's finally happened to them. And that's not a very satisfying answer, but. You know, the lifetime of a small company is typically 
that it's founded, it goes through a troublesome period when it's growing. And then at some point it gets sold to a big company, which does the delicate art of manufacturing, which is more difficult than people think it is and more important than people think it is. And it's best done in big companies with scads of good engineers who really know how to think about manufacturing and related subjects. So I would say that uh, we have a couple going now. This particular one, I'm wearing a sweater from Arsenal, which is going to be doing stents for nasal infections. And that probably looks like it's going to work well and there's a relief for people who have nasal infections, sinus infections as well. But you know, each one is different. It's like saying, which of your children do you like best? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the answer is, I can't answer that question because they're all different. And for some things, some are better than others. George, is there anything that you've learned from your time at Caltech, either institutionally or from John Roberts specifically, that really is, has stayed with you, that has informed the kind of scientist you went on to be? I learned all sorts of things from Roberts. Because, you know, starting at the beginning, he had the skill, and I actually have become more and more convinced he has the skill, to leave me relatively alone. So I set my own course, and he, he was very helpful during it in this process of writing papers, but it was it was not directive, it was more assistive. And then the underlying idea that if you work with smart people, um, good things come of that, sometimes by accident. So my ability to solve the problem of line shape in NMR spectroscopy came from talking to one of Harden McConnell's graduate students or postdocs. Uh, and he was a smart guy. I couldn't for the moment tell you what his name was. But he was a very smart guy, and he taught me what I needed to know in a very efficient way. And I mean, the mere fact he put up with me was, uh, you know, a good thing to do. But the underlying issue of trying to understand um, what you, what what's important enough to do in retrospect, is, which is I think what you're really asking, is a, a tricky question to answer because it varies with the subject, with your age with the number of students, with their, their point of view. I think the major, the major thing, one of the major things that I learned as a research director really came from, of all people, my secretaries, who at one point sat me down and said, look, the thing you need to understand more clearly than you do is that running a research group, or a research group is a social organization, it's not a scientific organization. So what you need to understand is what the people want and what the people do and how they think about things. And then you try to help them and things will work out at that point fairly well. But you've got to do it that way rather than doing it from the point of view of, of uh, your view of just of what the best science is. And I think it's largely correct. And I think that the university is not very good at teaching that particular point of view. But it's one that you came to appreciate from secretaries, it's of all people. From secretaries, yeah. And when people go off to get university jobs, I tell them that the one group of people they must get to know and must get to be sympathetic with and learn to operate with are the, the sort of staff in the department, whoever that turns out to be, the secretaries, the machine shop operators, all the rest of those people, because those know how to really make things run. They're the good engineers of a academic environment. Finally, George, looking to the future, I want to ask a question about technology. What are yeah. some of the technologies that you're most excited about? And in that same vein, what are some developments either in, in simulation, artificial intelligence, that might give you pause, that might take science in a way that might be troublesome for you? Well, I mean, we're interested in, we've been interested in for a number of years, AI. And the underlying notion there, you're more than familiar with, but that question of the mere fact that it's easier to ask a machine questions than it is to think it through yourself, 
what does that do to the process of self-training that leads to creativity? And I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure that that's a helpful idea. So we're going to have to see how that works. But I think we're going to go have another. We had our initial flurry into AI in the mid 90s somewhere, but actually in the early 90s. And at that point, we couldn't find what we needed in the way of data sets so that we abandoned the subject. But I think now one can do it a little bit differently. But I don't know whether it's really going to end up being good for science, science or not. I know it's going to be good for technology. And exactly how one makes something of that is an interesting question, which users will have to figure out as they have figured out what to do with the internet and the web and things of that kind. So, you know, what else is there? The neuro, the neurological sciences are obviously extremely important in understanding how the brain works, but I don't see a lot of life in those areas yet, which is, it may well be my fault, not their fault, but it is, I don't see a revolution occurring in that subject, in those subjects. But then, you know, the question of can you, can you manipulate matter to make something that's fundamentally new? I think the chances are we're going to be pretty good at doing that. And what we do with it, I'm not sure, but we're going to be doing that. And then finally, the military, for better or for worse, has been a very strong contributor to the development of new technology. And what does the military need? And I don't know right now. I mean, what what does one do with a hypersonic weapon other than building a hypersonic weapon? And I, I don't know the answer to that question. So that isn't really an answer. It's just this sort of a ramble. But it's useful indeed that that's the, the, these are the things that you think about. Right. George, it's been a great pleasure spending this time with you. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Okay. So good luck.